Welcome to This Week in Virginia. I have the amazing opportunity to interview Mr. David Bailey, and I'm so excited. Are you ready? <laughs> I am ready, Angel. And thank you for all the shows that you've co-hosted. And, and now um, you're, you're the host, and I'll, I'll be your guest for the next 25 minutes. So <laughs> you, uh, I'll try my best to answer your questions. Okay. Well, thank you to Bonnie for giving me some of these questions as well. She came up with some great questions. <laughs> um, my first question for you is what or who influenced you the most throughout your childhood? Oh, well, it, it probably initially was my, my father, but then later in childhood, it was also my mother. So they both were really strong, very strong influences. Uh, my dad was a very trusting person and so I learned that from him. My mother was one who said, you got to think, watch out and see what their angle is. There's, there's something else going on, uh, sometimes suspicious. And that's so each of those uh, were influences for me. Um, growing up, what did you envision your career to be and have you achieved it? Uh, you know, that, that's a, a tough question. Um, Growing up, I thought I would follow in my dad's footsteps completely. My dad was a minister. And, and so I, I did follow that path uh, for a while and then saw that there were other paths that I should explore. But uh, that's, that's what I thought, um, probably from early childhood because he was, uh, he, he was my hero. Mm -hmm. Aren't you a minister? I, I still am, and uh, in fact, one of the senators that I've known before she became a senator uh, sometimes uh, startles people who are around us both when she says, hello, Reverend Bailey. I'm talking about my friend, Senator Louise Lucas, and because she knows me from, from way back, but, uh, but I still am officially also clergy, although I don't don't use that title in my work here at the Capitol. Um, how did you get started in politics? Ah, uh, in politics. You know, growing up, uh, the, the two topics that were our dinner time or supper time, as we called it, conversation, were religion and politics. Uh, when I grew up, and particularly by the time I was in college, I realized that many people thought those are subjects you don't talk about because they tend to divide people rather than to uh, bring them together. But interest in politics, uh, I can't remember when I wasn't. Uh, it really goes, goes back to childhood conversations around the supper table. When did you first get your start in, politi in politics? Uh, well, I suppose that would be almost what you would uh, consider politics. Uh, I, I didn't run for any offices in high school. Um, I was encouraged to do so in college and, and ran and had good campaign managers. And so we, we won, uh, fortunately. Uh, later when I was teaching at Blue Ridge Community College, there were a group of us uh, young professors who came in uh, and there were older professors and they were kind of running things. And uh, a friend who was teaching political science while I was teaching sociology and psychology uh, planned a coup. And I was the one they put up to be president of the faculty association. And then we one by one took every office in a, in a surprise move. So, so in that, in some sense, politics was involved uh, not in as you think about it, and people serving the General Assembly or something like that, but it's involved in, involved in politics very early. Um, you already said how you didn't run for office, but if you would have, what position would you run for? <laughs> uh, I, I'll, I'll have to confess that I have, I have thought about it at times years ago but you know, two aspirins and a good night of sleep took care of that. And uh, 
it, 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 I, I realized that was not something I wanted to do. And I think the predominant thing that kept me from considering running for any local office or whatever was that most of the people who run for office and are successful run as members of a political party. And I have not officially been a part of any political party. And I know what happens when you run as an independent. You tend to get some votes and you often become the spoiler who uh, helps someone else get elected uh, occasionally without even a majority of the votes. And I, I suppose that was one of the biggest, other big reasons why I thought I, did, I didn't want to do that. that I'd, I'd rather work with people who are elected than to run for office and probably not get elected because I'd be running as an independent. And that, that just doesn't, that rarely works. Okay. What positions would you run for? Would you have ran for? Uh, you know, I, I never really, uh, never really came all that close to considering any any position. Um, I know positions in local government are extremely important, and I know supervisors are extremely important. School boards important. I guess I toyed with with each of those at some time in the past. Running for the General Assembly would be a, a delight, uh, but again, you're not going to run as an independent. Uh, that would be that would be foolish. I had a lobbyist friend. In fact, he's still a friend who filed to run as an independent for the Senate against an incumbent senator, and we didn't know what had possessed him to even think about that, but he. He withdrew. I think he realized that that was going nowhere. And after he ran, even though he was not going to win, there's no way that he could really come back as an effective lobbyist, which he was, uh, after going after a sitting member of the state Senate. Mm, okay. um, when you're not at work, how do you spend your days off? Hmm. Great, great questions that you've got. That um, um, I, I most enjoy spending time with family. I really have so many people, particularly people my age, my peers, their daughters or their sons live somewhere in the U.S. or somewhere in the world, but nowhere nearby and Judy and I are, are unique and, and are thankful every day that it just so happened that our, our two daughters uh, live in the Richmond area. They got married, their husbands, I mean, their, their families are in the Richmond area. Uh, nice. We have five grandchildren uh, there in the Richmond area until it comes time to head off to college or to graduate school. And so spending time with family is just a uh, most enjoyable and relaxing time. I just came back from Massanutten and some time in the mountains. And that was, that was delightful and refreshing. It was great being back in the mountains because I love the mountains, but it was especially uh, great to be, be there with family. Do you have any hobbies outside of work too? Well, hobbies, um, I suppose in some degree, I have a prop that I could show. Um, this is uh, Sam Clemens or Mark Twain, and uh, I'm not a ventriloquist. I can't make him talk, but I have, uh, for a significant part of my lifetime, I've done a an impersonation of Mark Twain, and that's really been a hobby. It hasn't been uh, a source of trying to get income or anything like that, but just the fun fun of, of doing it. That's a hobby. I, I really enjoy photography, and uh, I get 
I get quite a few comments from people who see the pictures I post on Facebook of around Capitol Square. And I think that um, it's just, it's great fun to find an angle on a picture and to, to do pictures. So that's, that's probably my, almost my daily hobby. Do you take any good pictures out in the mountains? Because I know the views are beautiful out there. <laughs> I, I do. I do. And uh, I, I uh, share some of those on Facebook and share them with friends and then just uh, keep them to, to look back at them. But uh, I love I love early morning shots, uh, e evening sun sunsets. Um, and it's it's fun to try to uh, to try to capture the moment uh, as they would have said in the past on film, but now it's not film, but but to have it and be able to look back at it. I know um, like a few months ago, you mentioned to me that you were a part of um, Mark Twain fan club in college, right? Like you were invited for it. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, Hal Holbrook recently died. Hal Holbrook was was uh, the first person I ever saw do a performance impersonation of Mark Twain, and he was phenomenal what it, what he did. And my first getting, I think, what, what we we're referring to was in my senior year in college, uh, a history major, but also a speech and drama major. In fact, that's, that probably has the politics involved in because politics sometimes can be drama. Um, <laughs> and and so the political science history and the speech, the, the speech department got our, got the majors all together at the beginning of the senior year and said, uh, you're going to have to do a one person show for part of requirement for graduation. I don't remember that we applauded, but we were excited, all of the majors, because hams that we were uh in fact somebody spoke up i might have done it and said you mean people will have to come and watch us and they said yes we'll require people to come and see it so so that that's when i got started doing mark twain and uh, did an impersonation of mark twain to in order to graduate with my major and the next day i got my first booking and oh, wow. so I, I've, I've enjoyed doing the rest is being, being Mark Twain. Uh, he's got he's got great political lines. Uh, the one I often think about is the lie shall never perish, so long as Congress remains in session. Mm -hmm. The lie will never perish so long as Congress remains in session. And he's got other things too. These these were comments that he made in the late eighteen hundreds and the early nineteen hundreds. And they they still hold get, it. Yeah. yeah, they do. They do. Nice. Hmm. Um, if you could pick up and move tomorrow, where would you go? Uh, well, they'd have to move the capital. Uh, <laughs> if they'd have to move move it. Uh, no, move the, if I, you could pick up and move. I know, but I'm saying if I were doing it, I'd want the capital to be moved too. Uh, when, I, <laughs> when, I, when I first moved to Richmond from uh, Bridgewater over in the Shenandoah Valley, I thought it's a shame that the capital is not in Charlottesville because mm -hmm. that's that's got mountains and I don't know why Jefferson didn't work to try to get the capital in, in Charlottesville. I never got a chance to ask him, but uh, but I think if if I were moving unrelated to the work that I enjoy doing, it would be somewhere uh, in the mountains, whether it would be out west or whether it would be southwest Virginia, which it really is, mm. was was home to me and a good part of my life and still feels like feels like home when I'm there. I agree with you with Charlottesville. I just took a trip with my my family to Charlottesville and because my sister went to UVA and UVA is just so beautiful. Charlottesville as a whole is beautiful. I, I feel like the capital should be over there too. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, 
Uh, I look out the window and see it right here in Richmond. So I don't, I don't think we have very little chance of getting it moved now, but uh, uh, that, that <laughs> would have been, it would have been more central and everything, but uh, yeah, I guess Richmond was a, that's where the falls of the James came in. It, it was logical to be, to be Richmond back then. And, and, and it will stay that way. I'm sure. So did you answer my question? Where would you pick up and move? Out west? Southwest? Yes. And I would really have to do some deliberation about which place, but that would be somewhere somewhere where there's mountains. Okay. Um, and I like being in the mountains, but I like being where I can see the mountains as well as being in the mountains. You know, there's okay. kind of a difference that you could be in a wooded area and you're in a mountain, but it's fine. But I, I, I love, to, love to see the mountains. Okay. Um, what is one of your fondest adulthood memory that you will always cherish? cherish? Probably, and going to graduate school, in New York and kind of the welcoming party for the new students, I spotted someone, I said, I, I want to meet her. And um, a year later, that person and I were married. Oh. And and so um, that that I can still I can still see her uh, from a distance when I first saw her. And it's great being able to see her up close for all these years. <laughs> oh, that's cute. How long have you guys been married? This anniversary coming up later this month will be the 55th year. Oh, wow. Child, childhood bride, yes. Oh, that's so sweet. Um, if you could switch careers, what else would you be doing? Related or unrelated to what you have been working up? to you can be anything in the world hmm. well it's um uh, i have thought at times and it comes back to me now and it probably somewhat relates to what i'm doing um uh, i would i would have my law degree hmm. and i don't know that i'd be practicing as a attorney uh, it wouldn't be in corporate law that's for sure but i think it would be uh being a people's lawyer I, I toyed with that probably 30 years ago and i remember talking to a member of the house of delegates and asking him if he would be willing to to sue one of the state's law schools and he, he laughed. He said, what are you talking about? I said, I said, the law schools here in the Commonwealth that are that are owned by the Commonwealth, they're not the private ones like University of Richmond. These were the William and Mary's and UVA's. You cannot be a part-time student. And I said, I think that's discriminatory. And I told him about my cousin who went to NYU law school at night while he was working, got his law degree. Um, I was glad in recent years to see that University of Richmond certainly is one that has accepted part-time students. Mm -hmm. I think Congressman Ben Klein may be one of the first ones who got his law degree while he was a member of the House of Delegates um, part-time. Part and so I think that it'd be kind of hard to change the career right now, but if, it, if I had a different career, I think to have, to have been a, an attorney, uh, one of my favorite people who's not a close friend by any means, who is a minister in New York City, uh, has her theological degree, her law degree, and she's also an entertainer. And I think that's a, that's a great combination. And I enjoy having two out of three, but she has all three. Um, what sparked your interest in creating David Bailey Associates? Hmm. Well, I, I was not so much interested in, in seeking to join some other firm. 
and it needed to have some name. And along the way, I quickly picked up after trying some really esoteric name that no one could understand what it meant. It was a Greek word. I said, uh, I heard, just name it a name that people can't forget. So I'm David Bailey. So it became David Bailey <laughs> Associates. And, uh, and then we've gone on from there. My last question for you is, if you could have three wishes, what would they be? Uh, it, it would sound kind of crazy, but it was, what came back to my mind was uh, uh, world peace. <laughs> I, I'd go for a big one. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I remember saying somewhat jokingly years ago, and they'd say, what do you want for Christmas? I said, peace and a $5 bill. <laughs> and uh, I would up the $5 bill now, but, but the, the a piece. I think uh, a second wish would be that uh, people that I've had the opportunity to work with, interns like you, and then people who become employees, would uh, <clears throat> find your niche. And I would wish that for my grandkids too. Find your niche and and really. Uh, uh, enjoy doing what you're doing. I, th I think it's. I think people enjoy doing all kinds of things. And I think that it would be a wish that those whom I know and have worked with and those children that I love, that they would, would find their niche. Uh, our daughters have done that. And I would wish that, that for a, a third wish. Uh, Probably most people, particularly those who've had the opportunity to live as long as I have lived, would just wish for for health as, as long as I live just for health. Yeah, so that's, yeah. I'd probably stick with those. If, if, I'd, if I'd thought about the answers, I think I would probably stay with those. A, a global one. A, f a one for people like you and and family, and then one for me. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Thinking of other people before you think of yourself. Mm. That's a good way to describe you, I think. Mm. Well, that's all the questions I had for you. Um, this has been a great opportunity, and I'm so grateful that you let me be an intern for you and, and let me grow here. It's been an amazing opportunity opportunity and I will miss co-hosting for you on this show. Well you've done you've done a great job and I hope this experience will be helpful to you moving forward. And I hope that in your last show that we'll be playing next week that maybe you will get your delegate I, who has made a promise to you and he knows who he is. You. <laughs> <laughs> and I know there's another delegate that you've discovered is really uh, in your neighborhood that you're reaching out to. So uh, Hopefully, in, in, I invite, guess folks, invite folks to uh, watch your Swan Song interview co-hosting next week. You got a chance to interview your senator early on, Senator Saraville, and that was excellent interview and people who haven't seen that might want to go back and find that show all of our shows are on this week in virginia tv and i learned things about scott that i didn't know that you pulled out in that interview and it was a good job very good job so thank you and uh, thank you for not being too tough on me today <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> well this is the end of the show Thank you so much for this opportunity and I'll see you next week. <laughs>